Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to episode 44 of the Physique Development Podcast. We're going to jump right into it today. So this is part two of the first time for competitors. Uh, Sue, Sue will repeat the, the actual t- title, but it was episode 30, <laughs> 33. I somehow forgot it in a matter of 10 seconds. So uh, episode 33 is what we're kind of creating a part two for here. And so we're going to we're going to run through some, some questions here, tend to be exact and uh, get things going. Yeah. So that first podcast, like you said, was episode 33 and it's what to know as a first time competitor. So if you haven't listened to that podcast, definitely go check it out as we talk through a lot of really helpful information. Um, And then also we do have an article on our website. It'll be linked in the show notes that our coach McKenzie has written and it's all about the price point of competing. So we did talk about price within that podcast, but if you want to see the breakdown, then definitely go check out that article on the physique development development website. But we're going to go ahead and dive into a few questions that you guys wrote about show day. And then we'll be doing a part three talking about what to expect or about prep, but (laughs) what to expect on actual show day. So if you're a first time competitor and you have no idea what actual show day looks like, stay tuned for part three and we'll be going over that. So getting started here, we had some questions. So one of the questions was, there's all different divisions, which one is right for me? It's going to be dependent on uh, your musculature as as well as um, what you enjoy. And I think that it's going to be a combination of the two where I would encourage the, the athlete to select the division that they want to be in rather than only focusing on what they fit into. Because um, if you you know, stature wise, maybe fit into bikini now, but you really want to be in figure. Well, the, the training that you're going to be doing for bikini is just not going to be conducive to building a, you know, these massive lats, as well as these very well-developed quads in the long haul. And if you need to take more time away from the stage to get to that point, I would encourage you to do that rather than, you know, just bikini competing in bikini because you, you can or should at that very moment. Yeah. And if you're new to competing and you're like, well, I don't even understand what the divisions are. I don't know what I want. The MPC News Online is the website. We'll also have that linked in the show notes. It goes over every single division and what the judges are asking for and shows examples of what those physiques look like. So look at those pictures, look at those descriptions and see, hey, I really love the look of bikini or I really want to do wellness or I really want to do men's physique, whatever it may be. Look at what you want to do and exactly what Alex said, facing that off of what you want to do, unless it's something where you do want that coach's take of, hey, why am I going to be the most competitive in? Because a coach can always give you the the best advice in that, especially if they really are great at coaching competitors of being able to tell you what you're going to fall into, as well as based on what effort you're willing to put in. Not to say that, oh, bikini takes less effort per se, but it is something that each division is going to require something different out of you and possibly a different extreme for you to go to. So being able to take that into consideration. Um, So the next tier is what are the judges looking for specifically in bikini? So like I mentioned, all of the outline of each division is on NPC News Online. But if you guys kind of want to take it as far as what are the judges looking for? Um, I can actually just read this from the NPC news website, because I took a screenshot of it and we can kind of go over it and I can give my, my thoughts, because this is something that I share with all of our bikini competitors specifically, um, so that they have an idea of, of what the, the judges, um, from a standard perspective are looking at as well as kind of giving my two cents, because it is going to vary from region to region of what they're looking for. But on the national stage is the standard is going to more so hold true. So one thing you do want to do is pay attention to the, um, Olympia champion of your division that you're wanting to compete in. That is going to be their standard of the individual from a presentation perspective, from a shape perspective and and those things. But if you look at it from the actual website, it's going to um, have a muscularity component. I'm speaking to bikini. So muscularity, the amount of, of muscle. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't read. That's talking about all of them. (laughs) disregard that part. Uh, For bikini, you're going to have a foundation of muscle, which gives shape to the female body. So kind of what they're alluding to on that front is that it's going to be a, uh, an amount of muscle tissue that's not over and abundant necessarily. So if you were to kind of put this in a standard, maybe say that um, you look like you lift, but you don't look like 
you're overly jacked necessarily. Yeah. Which I think that's a adequate standard from a muscularity perspective for a bikini athlete if you were just to be like in street clothes. Yeah. You are not going to be wearing a t-shirt and someone be able like a even a t-shirt that fits you, a normal t-shirt and someone be able to tell that you're jacked out of your mind. Right. <laughs> and when we when they're on stage, you're going to be carrying more muscle tissue than what you would think necessarily mm -hmm. a, a good deal more than what you would think because of how lean you are. Like the, the density of that tissue is going to be very, very important. Okay. And then within the, um, uh, the other kind of category or category of that would be full and round glutes with a slight separation between the hamstrings and the glutes themselves. Now, this is going to, again, vary from region to region. Some want to have greater separation. Some um, want to have a more full look. But on the national stage, it's going to be a good balance between the two. Um, and we want to see kind of the etched out glute, but not so peeled that you see striations. And so you want to have the, the full kind of uh, bubbly look to your glutes as a whole with that little bit of separation between the, the hamstrings, the glutes, and a little bit of the adductor, but not these well overpronounced adductors as a whole. Yeah. And um, as Alex said, as far as looking at the Olympia winners and being able to use that as the gold standard, if that might be a little bit like overwhelming because they are the best of the best, again, just looking at who wins. Now, the regional stage is going to be very different because they're picking from who's in front of them. So with Alex talking about different regions, it's talking about the judges for those reason, regions, not talking about the individual people that live in those regions of what they like. The judges for those regions are going to vary some. Like, for example, we've noticed that Indiana judges might like a little bit of a harder look than Kentucky judges and stuff like that. But if you want to be able to get a good idea of what they're looking for, go to NPC News online again, and you can look up any winner from any national show. And so looking at the national shows, looking at who got top three, um, and really being able to use that as your guideline. And the more recent shows, the better because the sport does evolve. So don't go look back at 2010 and be like, this is the standard. That's no longer the standard. Look at current pictures, um, current winners to be able to see where those separations are, what people are looking like, what they're going for as winners. Yeah. And then the uh, last three components of what they're looking for is going to be a small amount of roundness to the delts, which I would not say that small amount of roundness is a, a good uh, verbiage for that. They're looking for pretty well-pronounced delts. And this is going to be dependent also on the density of bicep and tricep tissue that you carry. So if you're carrying a good bit of bicep and tricep or density to the muscle belly, you're going to have to outweigh that with the density to those delts. And so the balance of the entire upper arm is going to be very important. So you want to deprioritize bicep and tricep volume a decent bit so that the, uh, delt itself is, is much more pronounced within the, the posing. And then you have the conditioned core. So you're wanting to have a little bit of, of, um, definition through your core, but you're not wanting to see like cross striations through your abdomen and your obliques to be like veiny and those different factors that would be too far into conditioning. And then your overall look is a huge piece to bikini. So your, your hair, your makeup, your, your suit, how you're posing, that's going to be a massive piece within bikini. It's massive within every division, but bikini is going to be the most abundant in terms of that overall presentation playing a, a massive role in how you carry yourself on stage and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so another thing to kind of keep in mind within bikini is that it, depending on your height, things are going to look a little bit different, or it might be something that you have to structure things a little bit differently. I mean, if we're looking at someone who's five one versus someone who's six foot, the shape of their body and the muscularity is going to look different and be different. So it's also something to look at the different height classes within di the divisions to kind of see what's winning around your height, because those looks to the physique are very different. Um, going on to the next question here, Austin, are supplements necessary to be successful within competing? Oof. From a, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty broad question. I'll, I'll deflect more to, uh, someone I would even <laughs> ask that question to, which would be Alex. Um, you know, supplementation in and of itself, again, is going to be supplementary to training, to nutrition, to the, the, entire approach you're having, right? The entire 
approach your coach has um, as a whole. So I think it's I think it's important that you nail down the things that you need. And I think that's going to differ for each individual, right? And to what severity are you desiring from that? And what do you need as a whole, right? And so Alex, I, I'm going to kind of deflect this question back to you because, uh, or, or to both of you in, in the sense where, you know, from a supplement standpoint, I, I, you know, kind of getting out of the competing realm a little bit from a coaching perspective, you know, I, I deal with more just your everyday folk who aren't looking to get on stage. And so that supplementation looks a little bit different, uh, pretty significantly different sometimes, um, depending on what they're wanting to achieve. So uh, from a stage perspective, Alex, I'm going to, I'm going to deflect all responsibility back onto you here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, from a supplementation standpoint, it's going to be dependent on, on what you're deficient in. Uh, as Austin talked about, I would say that uh, some base products that would be kind of across the board for everyone is going to be magnesium. Magnesium is going to be very often depleted within most competitors just from the stress that we're putting on the body from a fat loss standpoint, as well as just the training and the cardio and, and the insufficient calories as a whole. Um, it's going to be important that we keep magnesium stores on a, a high uh, level. I think that things that are going to be calming down the central nervous system are also extremely important. So things like taurine and things like theanine are going to be abundantly important. Those are just going to be two very basic amino acids that are going to help with, um, in a, a very simple way, calming down the nervous system. Like I said, um, a multivitamin is probably going to be advantageous just because of the potential lack of, um, variance within your food selection. So you probably will get into a, a groundhog day component of prep. That's just the reality of it. And so the foods that you're going to be consuming are going to be pretty much the same. Thus, we may be missing some vitamins and minerals within that. So having a multivitamin is going to be important. Um, I'm sure that many competitors are listening to this saying that a, a pre-workout is, is going to at some point become very, very necessary to have a little bit of extra punch to have the uh, oomph to get behind the, the training sessions. Um, those would be the, the things that immediately come to mind. I think that it's going to be dependent on the individual's digestion, if they're experiencing any issues there or having some uh, issues with fiber or what have you, I think that those would be important pieces too from a supplementation standpoint. I'll also add fish oil to that yeah, list. Fish oil as well. um, and it's something that within that supplementation, uh, we're talking about just your average supplements. We're not expressing or talking about PEDs. We did talk about PEDs to a certain degree in regards to the first part of this podcast. But what I will say in regards to supplements is don't try to cut corners on this. Um, it's something that uh, when we're talking about pricing. I mean, competing in general is just expensive. And that does mean that it is going to be a luxury for a lot of people. And within that, you have to be willing to make sure that you show up as your best. So within that, you don't want to spend 15, 20 weeks prepping and at the end of the day feel like, oh, I don't want to spend the money on magnesium or fish oil or getting these things in place that my coach and I both think are going to be a good option. So it's something that, I mean, I've had to get supplements as we get to the end of a prep just because things in my body are changing. Um, again, that stress that you're putting on your body. And if you are like, oh, I don't really want to do that this last little bit, I'm like kind of tapped out on spending money. First, I get it. It's definitely exhausting, uh, but it's also something that you are going to need to be willing to realize that there is a place for that and they are helpful. So if I were to ask Alex, have you ever had a competitor take absolutely no supplements and get on stage? No. Yeah. So I would say that they are necessary to a certain degree. The amount of supplements is going to vary. And, and I will say that with um, different forms of birth control, we have to have pairings of different supplements to allow for the individual to have some balanced harmony to their uh, hormones in general. Or that's where you see kind of like the people of like birth control is terrible during your your fat loss phase or, or terrible through your contest prep and is going to stall your fat loss. It's a misunderstanding of, of how to still balance the hormones within the birth control. And you have to understand the different types of birth control and, and what supplements go alongside of it. And that's another aspect to supplements that would be a whole other podcast five hour podcast but um that's the the general gist uh maybe one day we'll get into that 
All right, going into the next question here. How do I learn posing and how should I practice? So I will go ahead and answer this myself. Uh, So as far as how you should learn posing, there's a few different ways that you can go about this. One is going to be self-teaching, and this is going to come from consuming a lot of posing content. If you think that you are going to self-teach yourself by just looking at one person's pictures and mimicking that, you are vastly wrong. You have to study the sport to self-teach. I have personally had a few different people help me with imposing, but a large majority of mine has been self-teaching and that's come from watching hours of shows, watching hours of posing, really learning about the intricacies of what that means, how you need to uh, like make a muscle pop, how you need to do it for the division. So that's another huge thing is making sure you find someone in your division that is good at it. It's something that I feel very confident and comfortable within teaching bikini posing. I'm not going to say, oh, since I've been around the sport, I'm going to now put teach wellness and figure posing too. Whereas there are people who might teach all three and might be great at them, but I know my scope and I know I'm not going to be the best teacher for these other divisions. And so being able to find someone that is going to be a good teacher within those divisions and learning as much as you can from them, even if you do have a posing coach. So the other two options are a virtual posing coach or an in-person posing coach. And for that in person, you could also put a subcategory for going to posing seminars. But at the end of the day, you have to put in effort. Same with prep in general of even if you hire a coach, you still have to do the work and you still also have to reverse engineer stuff yourself. Having a coach isn't a magical ticket to everything being perfect. And so it's something that within posing, if you're not studying your own posing, if you're not taking that time to pose and to learn more about your body, you can't expect to get better. So as far as how you should practice, I recommend kind of taking it in little snacks, so to speak. So instead of forcing yourself, I'm going to practice for an hour a day and I'm going to stand here and pose for an hour. First, if you're first starting off posing, there's no way you're going to last to an hour because that's hard as crap. But also the other thing there is that uh, when it comes to Uh, how long your body can stand in those positions and what all that looks like. Sometimes it's easier to break those into 10 or 15 minute increments, even if it does culminate to an hour in a day of breaking that up and being able to play around with things. So um, it's something that you want to be able to pose after you're done training when you're tired and exhausted and maybe you're sore already um, and being able to hold that because if you can hold it when you're tired, you can hold it at any point. Being able to pose when you send your progress pictures, being able to pose throughout the day and seeing how your body changes, being able to pose when you have a pump, when you don't have a pump, um, using a mirror, not using a mirror. Um, These are all going to be really important things. And again, we could go into a whole spiel on posing in and of itself, but it is going to take your effort and it is going to take you learning regardless of if you do have a coach or not within posing. Going on to the next question, what is the difference in coaching for lifestyle versus competitor, Alex? Um, this is there's going to be a good bit of, of crossover, I think. Um, but I, I think that the the main components that are going to be different is the the rigidity to uh, the nutritional protocols. So for our lifestyle clients, we're going to have a little bit of, of greater variance within their day to day intake and and kind of a uh, a a window of plus or minus maybe 10 grams of carbs going either direction. Whereas within, um, within competitors, we're going to have, um, a, a zeroed out mentality within the nutritional allocations, a, a greater structure potentially to, to meal timing. And then also, uh, timing of training sessions, timing of cardio, those things are going to be a little bit more, um, necessary relative to the lifestyle client where it may just be, you know, get your training in or get your cardio in maybe in the morning or post training. Whereas with the contest prep client, we will be specifying, do we want the cardio post training? Do we want the cardio to be fasted. Those different factors are going to be more specific. Um, And I think that specificity is just the biggest difference as a whole, as well as um, less room for for air and and, um, greater focus in those different factors. And a higher expectation. Yeah, higher expectation. As a coach and as a client, you should have a higher expectation if you're approaching a lifestyle versus a competition. And then uh, how much cardio is involved during a prep, Austin? 
Uh, so I experienced all kinds of cardio uh, <laughs> variants between all of my preps, right? And the more I th have thought about it over the years, you know, it comes down, you know, we talk a lot about sort of <clears throat> steps are all the buzz these days, right? Get your steps in, hit 10,000 steps, worry about your steps. And steps are something that you should worry about uh, because in this equation of, of input versus output, right? Food in versus or energy in versus energy out. It's one of those things that early on in my competing career, you know, I was getting upwards of 15, 20, 25,000 steps a day and working out one to two times a day and was living and breathing this lifestyle. And I was also in a situation in college where all I had to do, like I just got up at 5, 36 AM and just started moving and didn't quit until I collapsed at night due to exhaustion, right? And so <laughs> when you have that sort of energy output, the need for the amounts of cardio that you may be expecting vary greatly, right? But as my life sort of progressed and got a little bit more sedentary, the more I got into more computer-based work and, you know, the, the physique development started to grow grow more and and our my life specifically really changed in terms of I went from, you know, working two or three jobs, training multiple times a day. Also, all those jobs that I had were very active for the most part, right? So um, I think you have to look at the the entire equation of energy output uh, and, and kind of what your daily life looks like, right? And, and that's sort of why we are specific in asking those questions and getting a sort of a lay on the land, lay of the land of, of how, how much you're moving, how, what type of movement, um, you know, I also had very physical jobs, right. Where I was picking up very heavy things, right. And Alex, <laughs> Alex can, can, can attribute to that as well. Right. And so you're burning a lot more calories throughout the day. And so a big part of cardio, especially during prep is going to be energy output, right. It's going to be sort of a caloric expenditure thing that we're, we're trying to equate for and trying to balance, you know, how much, how much of a deficit are we in versus how much cardio can we sustain without negatively impacting our physique on the way through our fat loss phase or you know impacting our training uh, through that competition prep and things like that. So the later preps I had, just to kind of round that thought out, had to have more cardio for sure, just from the standpoint of my lifestyle was, was changed and altered tremendously versus the beginning part of my competing career. And so I think that's a very relative question. And that's a question that's, or something you, you and your coach should definitely be very uh, together on of, okay, and honest about of like, hey, I don't move a lot. I, I sit at a desk all day. You know, I, I try to get up and move around. I get, you know, generally two to 3,000 steps a day. Then you're, you're probably going to do some cardio for the sake of, of you just need, you need output. You need to, do, you need to move. You need to be physically active to kind of keep these wheels turning throughout the prep to kind of put the entire puzzle puzzle together. Um, but if, again, if you're a, if you're an intense laborer and you're physically very, very, very active, then that could shift uh, in your favor. But you also have to then regulate your training, right? You have to properly periodize your training based off of if you are exhausted throughout your daily life, just because of the work you do, your training's going to have to be altered slightly um, from the sake of matching stresses, right? So all stress is stress and managing stress throughout your prep is such a big thing that I think a lot of people forget. And I know we get into the, we're our worst enemy in prep. You know, I th that's why I think having a coach is such a big, a big thing, or at least, you know, having someone there in your corner is such a big thing. But usually as prep goes, we want to get more intense. We want our workouts to be, to get more grueling in our heads, right? We want all these things to be true. We, we kind of give more effort at the end, which isn't a bad thing, but if you're, if you're outworking your recoverability, if you're outworking your ability to, to manage that stress, we can start to actually work in the other direction sometimes. And so, you know, you can be your worst enemy in this situation. And that's why I think having a coach in your corner to kind of be that objective eye to say, Hey, I get it. I've been there, but trust me on this. We need to dial it back if you're going to keep taking steps forward. Yeah. 
And you'll never know until it comes down to that moment. No coach can predict, hey, throughout your whole prep, this is going to be the max amount of cardio you'll ever do. And each person is going to be dependent depending on how cardiovascular adept they are, as well as um, the factors Austin talked about, and then how many times they've dieted before and what that resistance looks like in that regard. So you never know until you're doing it. <laughs> the last thing I'll add is that um, one thing to pay attention to as the prep goes on is that oftentimes individuals will get lazier, um, meaning that they will start to get a uh, to a situation where it's like, are they still cleaning up things around the house? Are they still taking out the trash? Are they still taking their dogs for a walk? And because they're like, well, the cardio is just so much and the training so much and my food's so low, I'm just constantly sore. And so they're just kind of laying on the couch all day. Um, and then they find themselves in the situation where they just have to keep ramping up cardio because they're like, I don't know what's, I'm not losing the same amount of body fat. You have to be very cognizant. And, and that's why steps are so valuable. And for us, when we're, when we're programming uh, cardio, this is another piece of it is that the cardio itself is not going to be attributed to the steps, not because it's like, this doesn't count, but it's more of, we don't want to lose that base of, of just basic neat that is transpiring. So for example, if we're having the client, you know, shooting for 8,000 or 10,000 steps, the, and we program the cardio, the cardio is going to be outside of those steps. We still want to have that base because if we're just getting still that base of 10,000 steps and you're contributing your cardio to that, well, you just had, you know, maybe three to 3,500 uh, steps at a higher heart rate, it's not going to be a huge difference than what you were doing to get those 10,000 steps prior. And so we have to have an understanding that that's going to be in addition to those steps that you already had in place and those factors. And don't make that harder than it is. All you have to do is look at your watch or whatever tracker you're using at how many steps you have before you start the cardio, make a note of it, look at how many steps you have after the cardio, that'll give you how many you got during and then make sure that you can add that together to figure out what is your end goal for how many steps you have to get plus that cardio added on. So don't make it more difficult than it is in that regard. All right. So how to know what shows to do and how far ahead to start a prep. Um, what shows to do, I would encourage, uh, the individual to speak with their coach, obviously. Um, but then looking around your area, seeing what you're wanting to, like from a budget perspective, you have to look at how much are you wanting to pour into travel? Are you wanting to this to be kind of a part of an experience to where maybe you go and do a show and then you stay in that area for a couple of days or, or something along those lines. Um, and then looking around your area for local shows, we try for our competitors to keep regional shows. Uh, local to them and mm -hmm. as, as close as we can to allow for us to have a greater expense within the national shows because national shows are going to be significantly more expensive than the the regional shows so being cognizant of that and then to to quickly add on the um the time that it takes from a, a prep perspective what i would tell you is to equate one pound of, of fat loss per week of prep and then add four weeks kind of as a buffer as your first prep so it is going to be a longer prep you want your first prep to be a little bit longer give yourself more time than what you think because um oftentimes the the first competition is going to be a a shotgun 10 12 week prep that you really needed about 20 plus and then you get up there and you're like I just wasn't there conditioning wise, or maybe you didn't, you know, whatever. And so giving yourself extra time and, and allowing for some hiccups along the way, because, you know, for, for my first prep, um, Austin and I would go and get, I don't know if this is first or second prep, but we would go into fresh market and get these Turkey burgers that we were tracking as just like your basic ground Turkey. <laughs> um, and after the prep, so we had those burgers, we had two of those every Tuesday cause they were like on special and on sale or whatever. So we had those all prep. And then after the prep, we realized, or were told, um, that they were infused with mayonnaise. So there was <laughs> hundreds of calories that were untracked. And that's just a simple air. Like, obviously we weren't doing it maliciously. The burgers tasted amazing. And I think in hindsight, it's like, we probably could have questioned this a little bit more <laughs> of, you know, why did this taste so exponentially better than any of the turkey that we would prepare? But in the moment it was, and, and the, you know, the preps went well, I, <laughs> I got into incredible shape and those different factors. Um, but it was just, you know, simple errors like that are going to transpire and you've got to kind of, uh, navigate through those. So giving yourself that little bit of buffer is helpful. Yeah. And if you are like, well, I've, I've never been stage lean, so I don't know what 
a number to shoot for. I don't know how much weight to lose. Again, that's something a coach should be able to help you with where, um, especially if you're going with a coach for prep, they should have some experience and be able to look at you and say, Hey, you're roughly going to have to lose 20 pounds. And that number might seem high to you, especially if you might be on the leaner side, but it is something if you've never been in stage shape before, you don't really know what that looks like, what that's going to entail. So that coach should be able to tell you, Hey, we're roughly going to need to lose X amount of weight. So then our prep's going to be this length. We're going to have some buffer time, especially looking at your schedule of, Hey, are you traveling during your prep for work or things like that? Taking all of that into consideration and using your coach as that resource and asking your own questions as well is going to be huge. All right. So how do you deal with hunger when calories are low? You just deal with it. I can do it. <laughs> just be uh, hungry. Yeah. I think not eating like a child yeah. uh, definitely is something to <laughs> something to mention, right? And when you're in the off season, when you're maybe in the early stages of prep, you have you obviously have a little bit more room for error. Um, you know, your basic nutrient uh, nutrients are, are taken care of because ca- calories are a bit higher. You have more shots shots on goal to actually hit those nutrient needs, uh, but one thing that that definitely happens as people diet down, uh, whether that be for a show uh, or just to diet down and, and you know to lose body fat as a as a lifestyle client, the lower the calories get, the the fewer shots on goal you get, right? The fewer opportunities you get to fill the fill those nutrient needs, right? And I'm meaning like micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals things that we're actually getting from our food, right? And so when we mix that with the actual volume of food we're eating, the satiety rate of that food, how many nutrients are in that food versus the the volume of that food, meaning, you know, we see all these photos on comparing foods on social media, right? Like why eat a salad that's 800 calories or 600 calories when you can have a Twinkie that's two Twinkies that are 600 calories. It's just, they're the same. And it's like, they're not though, you know, because (laughs) just because something is the same caloric amount doesn't mean it's as healthy or it's going to contribute the same to the, the actual metabolic things that we need to, to happen, uh, throughout that fat loss and in that harmony and that sort of synergy we need to have. Look at those, those are big words right there. Those are very good words. <laughs> Harmony and synergy we need to have between our nutrition, our training, our recovery, all of these things, right? Our, our, our ability to manage stress. And as Alex mentioned earlier with supplementation, obviously those supplements are there to supplement what you're not getting from your, your diet, but they're also not the safety net for you to just eat again, eat like a, eat like a, a nine-year-old at a birthday party, basically how I ate uh, for my first two or three preps and just hope that your multivitamin does the rest, right? We want to make up in the best I've ever felt through prep, right? The best preps I've ever had, the best I ever felt, the best I ever looked, the best I ever trained, all of the things was the biggest focus I had on eating whole nutrient dense foods. Um, I obviously had foods in there that were, you know, things that help my cravings and, and all of the things that we love with flexible dieting. But I was, I would say 90% of the time I was 90 to 95% on point with eating nutrient, high quality, nutrient dense foods, whole foods, foods that are, you know, have a high satiety. Um, and so satiety is your ability to feel full, uh, during your meal. So that's why, you know, salads usually do a good job because there's a lot of bulk there. There's a lot of things there to eat. Um, and each bite isn't, you know, just chocked full of calories typically. So you get a lot more, a lot more bites out of that. Um, but I would say in terms of dealing with hunger, it's, it's at the end of the day, you're, you're going through a controlled starvation. So you're just going to be hungry. And I think there's an acceptance factor to that. And I think the last point I'll kind of make here is you are not who you follow on social media, right? You are not the person, you do not have the same re, uh, response to food uh, that those are the same genetics to those you're maybe following on social media. And so if you're following people who are like, I can eat whatever, I'm never hungry. And I just get on stage and it's, it's this magical experience and <laughs> la ti da, right? And it's like, there's preps where I felt like that. You know, but there's also preps where I've 
been like, I don't know if I'm cut out. Like, I don't know if I can get through this. And I, I would label myself as a, a good dieter. Like I can trudge through some low calories and high output grueling workouts. I can do all of that. And I would say I'm pretty good at that, but there was still points in that prep where I questioned like, dude, I don't know, you know, this is just tough and it's hard, but you dig deep and you, like Alex said, you just deal with it. You get over it, but you also have things in your corner to sort of deal with it. Yeah. Uh, other stuff that I would add is that, um, I love flexible dieting as, as Austin talked about. Um, but I would say that planning and having, it doesn't have to be like a meal plan from your coach. I, I always encourage our athletes when we send over adjustments to nutrition, sit, sit down this evening and construct meals for the next week so that you have a plan in place. Because I think that a part of flexible dieting that many people get caught up in, especially in a contest prep setting is that, um, when they consume their you know, meal one, they're already kind of thinking about meal two and like, what am I going to have? And so then over the next three hours, they're obsessing about what am I going to eat? And they're just constantly thinking about food and not focusing on potentially the tasks that they had at work or, or things that need to be taken care of in that time frame. And so all day, they're just spending time thinking about what am I going to eat next? And that is obviously making you more hungry because it's all that's on your on your mind. Whereas for your meals, if you already have them constructed, you have them prepared, you know, when you're going to be consuming them, there's not a whole lot of thought that needs to go into it. It's just a matter of setting timers and being like, okay, it is time for me to consume meal two. You go heat that up. And the other thing within that is taking your time when consuming these nutrients, don't fly through them. This is what you've got today. As much as you may want to eat another, you know, more with that meal, you're not going to get it. So really enjoy what you got in front of you. Don't rush through it and you'll be a happy, happier camper as a, as a whole. Um, I, I think that going with these kind of hacks to, um, alleviate safe or alleviate hunger within excess gum chewing and, uh, zero calorie drinks and all these things that are just going to have high levels of artificial sweeteners and things like that are going to inhibit your digestion as a whole, which is going to be a detriment to your progress as well as how you feel. It may be helpful in the moment to have this large quantity of artificial sweeteners, but your digestion later on in the day is going to show you that, Hey, that probably wasn't the best idea potentially. Um, and so I think that those things are important too. Yeah. And um, within that, for the uh, thinking about your food, that's also going to cause decision fatigue throughout the whole day, which is going to really wear on you mentally. And within those hacks of chewing gum, drinking artificial or like sweetened drinks, low calorie drinks or carbonation drinks, that can give you that temporary, but then it can cause inverse effects. So I will go over just a few things that can help within dieting. Um, so one is going to be possibly pushing back your first meal. Now this is going to be dependent on the person because let's say you have to train early in the morning due to your schedule. I obviously do not want you to train at 5 a.m. and wait to eat your first meal until 9 or 10 a.m. But in my situation, it might be something where I can push back my meal 30 minutes to an hour in the morning. And once I've started eating, I get more hungry versus just waiting to eat. So that can be helpful, possibly pushing back your first meal or even doing a fast from carbs and fats or just from carbs for your first meal. So having a protein or just a protein and fat meal um, so that you can save your carbs for around your training or for later in the day where you might need some more energy. Another thing here is the size of your plate. So I did do a podcast on what to do when you have lack of appetite. So it's going to be the inverse of a lot of those factors there. Um, but I talked about using a bigger plate in the same color plate as your food. You want to do the opposite here. And there are studies shown that it can help within your fullness factor of getting a smaller plate and contrast it with your food. So if you have a white yogurt, you don't want it in a huge white bowl. You could have it in a small black bowl and that'd be better for you. Um, and then within vegetables, that is going to be a little bit of a slippery slope where they can help to add volume um, and to add less calories. But over consuming vegetables can cause cause problems with gas and bloating, as well as your fiber increasing, where as your food decreases, your fiber will likely have to trickle down a little bit as well. So those are just some more um, conscientious tips, but eating whole foods is a huge part of that. Because if you talk to anyone who's bulking, they often can't eat all whole foods because it's too filling. So you want to think about, hey, if it's too filling, then that means that it's probably going to be really great for dieting. Yeah. 
Uh, the, the one thing I will add of if you are to push back your meals in the morning, don't allow for that to push your meals so far back that you're eating like an hour before bed. That's yeah. the, the biggest thing is that now that's going to skew your weigh-ins in the morning. It's going to skew your look. It's going to skew potentially some fluid retention, potentially hindering your sleep. So you have to think of that in, in that context. I would say the latest that you would want to be consuming nutrients uh, before bed is going to be about two hours before. That would be like the absolute latest. Three hours is going to be kind of the, the perfect spot if you can you can hold off that long. I know that some individuals, especially later into the prep, if you were to have a meal uh, three hours before bed and then try to have your seven to eight hours of sleep, that would be pretty pretty challenging as a whole. You'd be waking in the middle of the night with some hunger pains and things like that. So, you know, I, I understand getting to the two hour marker, but that's kind of the, the place that you want to be, um, you know, for your last meal of the day. Yeah, those are really great points. Um, so the last question here is show is over. Now what? Show is over. Now what? Um, within that, you want to go into some review with your coach. And uh, this is a very important thing that we do within our athletes is that we we look at things and see if we could have made. Um, it, this is like within any sport, you're going to have like film study after. And this is kind of where I've taken that from within our coaching is that uh, following the the show, I go into kind of a, a film study of going through pictures and analyzing things from a peak week perspective specifically. And then I'll go through from a, a week to week standpoint to analyze, you know, were these the best decisions in terms of how we went about the fat loss? Um, could we have been more aggressive here? Could we have done things differently and so on and so forth, just to improve, not necessarily to, to beat yourself up if you fell short of the goal, but it's, it's important to be able to reflect and see where things were at. And if we could do things differently going into the next prep, because the worst, uh, you see this far too often within coaching. Uh, I, I get a lot of athletes who come and, and they've gone through, you know, multiple preps with with a coach and it's like well we just use the same approach every time and it's like well that makes no did you win the overall every single show did you peak perfectly every single show no i didn't well then why are you doing the same thing over expecting a different result there has to be change with the athlete moving forward to specify greater to them and so the more more peak weeks the more preps that you can have with a coach the better it should get every single time because we're learning more about your body we have better data points those different factors okay i'm off my soapbox with that within but i will say like within saying the the same um peak week and stuff like that no prep is ever going to be the same yeah regardless of if you did win the overall one season, using the exact same peak likely isn't going to be the case because your physique has hopefully changed in the time since you've been on stage. And so that is going to look a little bit different from year to year, no matter how much you've learned from that peak, you have to keep learning and applying that. Yeah. And I think that like I've had clients come to me from, from other coaching services where they had a prep and 2018 and then they prepped again in 2020 and they received the same plan those two years and so that's a massive red flag if this is is yourself and, and you're like damn this is happening to me i would at least speak up to your coach at that point and it's not that you have to leave immediately and, and anytime that you find things that you have questions on with your coach the first response is, is not just run away it's it's confronting the situation just as you would we with a partner or something along those lines of asking questions and seeing what the reasoning is because they may have a valid reason I don't, i'm not sure but um, that's important and then getting into the reverse diet and, and I, have we recorded something on the reverse diet before i don't believe so i think that should be its whole own episode yeah, that's a yeah whole other uh, process there and we can kind of get into the nitty-gritty and give you guys kind of a reverse dieting 101 out of contest prep we it can maybe apply from a lifestyle perspective and, and how we go about it. Because I think that from a lifestyle standpoint, um, you can be a little bit more uh, aggressive with getting back to maintenance. Whereas you, because you haven't pushed as low from a uh, potential calorie perspective, or you shouldn't have probably, and then uh, your body fat is just not as low either. And so it's a little bit easier to get back to that maintenance set point a little bit more uh, 
quickly relative to what you'd be doing post contest because the other aspect is now we're getting hormones back into balance if, if your cycle was lost during the prep and so that's a big focal point as well as just getting you into a healthy position from a caloric intake perspective decreasing overall activity those different factors yeah and since we're not getting into the full reverse right now another thing i want to mention is now the show is over there's a few things that you should keep in mind one don't just go out and eat like an asshole because you saw girls on instagram or guys on Instagram posts that they went and got this exorbitant meal after their show. Yes, you should likely be able to go have a free meal unless you have another show coming up very soon. But don't be an asshole and just eat until you're sick because... Uh, you just shouldn't do that. This is first a lifestyle. And second, let's take into context what that would do to your body after everything you've been through, as well as your mentality of seeing your body at its absolute smallest that you've ever seen it, and then giving it the largest influx of food it's had in 12 plus weeks. Um, another thing is to be a good sport um, and to have a good attitude regardless of how you placed. Um, now this goes to show even if you're on stage and your number hasn't been called or you get switched to an outer call out, keep that smile on your face. Don't be a, don't have bad sportsmanship. Don't be an asshole. Again, it circles back around to that. It seems like, um, as well as post show, talk to your coach and figure out what the game plan is. Don't go ahead and just be like, show is over. Now I get some flexibility, have a plan in place either before the show or have a plan to talk to your coach directly after the show. Oftentimes, we'll tell the client what to do that day and then say, hey, we're either going to get on a call in the next two days or you're going to have your full protocol over in your inbox in the next two days. But this is what you need to do for today. And this is the game plan here. Um, so those would just be a few things that I thought were worth mentioning for first time competitors. There's something that I missed, Alex, for right after the show being over. Um, I'll speak for myself from a coaching perspective. Um, I despise if an athlete wants to talk about reverse diet while we're still like the show is in front of us i have no interest in talking about you know what that sunday looks like what after the show looks like all i'm worried about is the show and then once the show is complete um, i will talk about all the things that follow it but the biggest thing that should be your focus you shouldn't be thinking about the meal that you're going to have with your family after the show you've been working very hard for the show so let's keep the focus there and then you know the conversation can transpire following the show and, and all that so yeah that's my two cents any helpful things that you feel like clients have done in the past year or this past season or in general directly post show like that next that evening or that next day that you think are very helpful for a first time competitor or for um, a competitor in general? Um, I, I think that being present with the people who were able to come and support you is, is very important following the show. I think that, um, competition days are very long and, and the individuals you know, with you being a first time competitor, the individuals that are, are watching, I imagine are, are going to be first time watchers. And <laughs> so, um, it's the longest, unless they've been a part of like gymnastics or, or swim meets or dance recitals as you were younger, potentially, mm -hmm. those are the only other sports that I can think of that are such long days without a whole lot of like action. Whereas if an individual is playing baseball in my context, where maybe I had three games in a singular day, well, my parents were watching me play the sport a large portion of the day. Whereas for a physique competition, they're going to see, they're going to be at the show for maybe, you know, eight hours that day to see you up there for maybe, I mean, you would be blessed to be up there for 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> very blessed, <laughs> very blessed. And that would be more of like a national stage to yeah. be up there for like 30 minutes, but a regional show, you could literally be up there for 10 minutes and, and that would put you in a position where, um, you know, they're there for eight hours. I don't even know what the percentage of time that is, but it's yeah. very, very low. And so being very loving and, and, and present with them following the show is very, very important no matter how you placed. Um, and then the, the following day is just being mindful of digestion and, and those different factors, I think has been a, a big factor as a whole. Yeah. Well, great. We'll go ahead and wrap this up then. Um, we lost Awesome for a little bit. So if you wondered where he was, he's he's back to say goodbye. Uh, but thank you guys so much for listening to part two of Things to Know for a First Time Competitor. Definitely check out part one and then check out the show notes for all of the links that we mentioned too. So peace out, guys.